This message is brought to you by House on the Rock Fellowship. We are a church that serves and cares for the Miami Valley region in Ohio. Before you continue, make sure to access the notes from our download section of our message page and have your Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Good morning. There's some real good looking guys here today. <laughs> uh, for singing special music today, I'd like to call up the House on the Rock Barbershop Men's Ensemble. <laughs> no, no. I have a pretty good idea who's behind this, and when I sit her down, there's going to be a conversation. So, Terry, you look good, man. That's a good looking shirt. Yeah, I do look good, don't I? Yeah, yeah. Reggie, boy, that's good. That looks nice. Paul, way to go. Guys, I think this means that if, yes, Stephanie, it's you, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Own it, girl. Own it. Own it. Everyone say goodbye to Stephanie. <laughs> My wife came in Friday or Saturday. She says, here, I got you a shirt. I'm like, what? She didn't buy me shirts. My radar went off, but I can see now that I am in good company. Men, I think this means that we should be allowed to buy them an outfit, right? <laughs> and they have to wear it, right? <laughs> I'm glad that you're here. For those of you who are guests, it is normally like this. This is kind of our church family. This is who and what we are. Hey, look at you. That's a good shirt. That is a, Jason, you look good, man. You look good. Well done, well done. Ha, handsome bunch, handsome bunch. Chris just wants to go home and change. He's decided he's not talking to Karen until Christmas. <laughs> uh, uh, special time of the year, a turning of the page. Uh, la yesterday we were at home winterizing, putting furniture away and cutting the plants down and getting things ready for the new season, things that are on the way. If you drove past, you've seen all the fields have been put to rest. The farmers have made sure that things are ready, that the land can rest now. I've reflected on this before. Maybe when it, I come to these changing of the season times. No doubt, if I went up to, you know, Brian Kronz, one of his pastures, one of his fields, and he has it all ready to go, and it's been a field that's brought in a great harvest this year. I know there's also plots of land around his farmland, maybe just across the street, 20 feet away, 30 feet away. That land has gotten the same rain. It's seen the same sun. It's in the same place. But that field, that yard, it doesn't have near the harvest that Brian's has over there. Why is that? Why is it that one plot of land can yield an amazing harvest and over here, so close to it, this land doesn't do anything? Maybe it's full of rocks, briars. Maybe it's been turned into a driveway. Maybe a house is there. Why is it that one field will produce and another field won't? Well, anyone who knows anything or doesn't even know much of anything about planting and farming knows that that land has someone who cares and tills and preps and seeds and works that land. That there's a pattern of life that manifests in that land that this land over here does not experience. Pattern matters. In fact, I know if I were to sit down with Brian or other farmers or other gardeners, they would tell me that their life follows a specific, a specific pattern. A flow that when March happens, we do this. And when April happens, we do this. And when May happens, we do this. And for some of them, they don't even have to have the check sheet. They've been doing it for so long. They know when to do what. It's a part of them. They live it. They breathe it. Yeah. 
so that, that the land will produce a great harvest. Yeah. Jesus' life had a pattern to it. There were things that Jesus did on an annual basis, on a monthly basis, on a weekly rhythm. Jesus kept a weekly rhythm. There were things that Jesus did on a daily rhythm that enabled him to do what the Savior of the world would need to do. So much so, you have examples like in Luke chapter 11, his disciples walk up to him and say, hey, we've seen you pray. Will you teach us to pray? John's disciples teach him to pray. They teach him to pray, him to teach them to pray. Will you teach us to pray? Will you show us that pattern that you have? Jesus says, yeah, when you pray, say this, repeat this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He gave them a pattern. He gave them an outline, a contour that creates and fosters good field. And good field creates good harvest, doesn't it? Yeah. The Apostle Paul would echo the same thing to his churches and his followers. You imitate me as I imitate Christ. Okay, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. You imitate me. You follow my pattern as I follow the pattern of Jesus. He says a similar thing in Philippians chapter four, verse nine. I'd love to show you this verse. Go ahead, Ryan. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Look at that. What you've learned, what you've received, what you've heard from me, what you've seen in me, practice that. Practice my way of life, my way of faith. Practice how I study. Practice how I pray. Practice my weekly rhythms. You do the things that you saw me doing. You imitate me as I imitate Christ. Patterns. And do you see what he says at the end? And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. Reminds me of what James says in James chapter four. You draw near to God and God will draw near to, to you. Maybe if that other field followed some of the same patterns that this field kept, it might experience some of the harvest that this field experiences. Maybe I look at another follower of Christ and I say, why do their prayers get answered? Why do they seem to go through storms differently than I do? Why do they serve differently? Why is their marriage different? Why is their parenting different? What is it about that field that seems to produce something that my field doesn't? Maybe their pattern's different. Maybe there's certain things that they do a certain way. And that pattern produces a produce, a harvest. We call that pattern Habitus. Habitus. Sounds like habit. Sounds like habitat. A habitus is a shared pattern that shapes a people. A shared pattern that shapes a people. Let me give you an example, okay? I see three lights. One is green, one is yellow. What color is the third? How'd you know that? How'd you know that? This is in my head. You guys aren't in my head, are you? Seriously, I saw three lights. One was green, one was yellow. What color is the third one? And red means what? How do you know that? We share a share. We have a pattern that we share, don't we? And it shapes us. Well, it should shape us. I don't think some of you guys know what some of those colors mean. Yeah. A similar, a similar example. You might drive home from church today and on the drive home, someone might have an evergreen tied to the top of their, tree, top of their car. And you're like, oh, I know what they're doing. They're going to go home and do what? They're going to decorate a Christmas tree. You would think that's normal. That's expect. We have this shared way of doing life that creates patterns and shapes us and molds us. A shared experience. That's come. Now, if you were to see that in June, you'd be like, dude, what are you doing? That's, that's, that's not how we do things. That's not how we do things. If I were to hang out, let's say I told Brian, Brian, I'm going to move in next harvest, next season, okay? Is that all right? I'm, I'm going to be your farmhand. Is that all right? 
Oh, you don't think I should get Karen? Just rolled her eyes, man. Someone get Karen's eyes back to the front of her head, please. <laughs> Brian, I, I want to follow, because I, I believe this. If I were to spend season after season after season watching a farmer, you know what would start to happen to my way of life? I would start to embody those things and practice those things and know those things. Right now, I would need, I would need a checklist. I would need to know, okay, it's March, so we're going to do this, and we're going to, okay, this is how you turn the combine on. Okay, I wrecked the combine. We're going to, okay. And we'd have to, I would have to have a step by step by step to turn me into a good farmer. But eventually, as I spent more time in his pattern, in his space, that would begin to mold me and shape me and affect me, wouldn't it? Some of you great athletes, you spent years playing a particular sport and you know it. You know it inside and out. You know the pattern, the shape of the game. Some of you, I could put you right in the middle of a soccer pitch and you'd have no idea what's going on. You're like, please don't. Everyone stop. And my sons would just, they would have fun with you all day long because you have no, you'd, you'd reach to grab the ball. Like, you don't touch the ball. Put the ball down. What's wrong with you? Now them, they lived that game. They breathe that game. They know that game inside and out. It's a part of them. That pattern, that shape, and that space. They don't have to think about it. It's second nature to them. They've been so shaped by it, so molded by it. And when you see an amazing sports team that's been playing together for a long time, they just know where each other's at. They can just feel and sense the presence. They've been molded and shaped by it. Being near each other, being affected by each other. A pattern of life. My mom used to keep magnets on the refrigerator growing up. Did your mom used to have magnets on the refrigerator? Letters and numbers and you'd make words. She also had these magnets. They were, they were like donuts. Okay, you ever have the donut magnets? They're just, yeah. and you, I'd try to press them together as much as I get the pole, get the pulse and you try to force them, but you have to flip them around and then they're attracted to each other. Yeah. There's a way of doing life that attracts us one to another and shapes and affects us. But I also know this. I learned this about magnets. That if you have a really powerful magnet and you put a weaker magnet next to it, that weaker magnet will become transformed by that larger magnet. And it will affect it and shape it and change it. So now that weaker magnet is attracted to the things that the bigger magnet's attracted to. There are other patterns at play in our world that want to mold us and shape us and move us in ways that are not best, are not gospel, are not good. I guard myself from Assassin's Three, Satan's society and the sin in me. That Satan has a pattern that he would love to get me into, a pattern that will put me away from God like a magnet, a pattern that will push me away from gospel and away from community. Society has a pattern like the mad, mighty Mississippi River has so much weight and current and flow to it and it's so easy to slip into that current and to be pushed along and before I know it, church is gone and faith is gone and community is gone and my marriage is gone. There's a pattern to it and if I slip into it, but even more than Satan and even more than society, there is a sinful, sinful heart inside of me that resists the patterns and the shapes of God. So much so that Sunday morning rolls around and I'm like, I really need to get the Christmas decorations out. Dude, you hate Christmas and you hate decorating, but man, you rather do that than show up to church on Sunday morning. It's life group night. Yeah, I think I got to go shopping. You hate shopping. It's Bible reading time. Ah, I really need to go to the dentist. <laughs> there is a sinful heart inside of me that so resists the patterns of faith. But Jesus had a pattern. Paul had a pattern. Our faith has a pattern, a rhythm, a way of doing things. That if a Christ follower will step into it, they will experience produce. They will experience faith. They will experience the abundance of God's grace. If we draw near to God, he draws near to us. Back in July, 
Carolyn and I began designing and preparing a pattern to share with you. Something that would help mold and make us into mature followers of Christ if we wanted to step into it. There are lots of aspects to following Jesus. Many points that are important disciplines and habits. This pattern is about preparing us to gather together with followers of Christ. A show of hands. How many of us grew up in a home, that means grow up from birth up into high school, in a home that had a religious, devout commitment to going to church on Sunday morning, meaning if it was Sunday morning, we were going to church. Raise your hand. Like, there was no question. Like, if you came up to mom and said, hey, are we going to go to church today? It's Sunday. She'd be like, duh. Thank you. How many of you did not grow up in that experience? Raise your hand. It's okay. No, it's not thing to be ashamed of. What we need to know is patterns shape us, patterns mold us, patterns make us. There's a habitus that you grew up in. And the Christian life has a pattern. And maybe you're one of those people, you look at the field of your faith, and you're like, why aren't things growing here? Why does it feel like things die here? Where did they get that joy from? How can they pray like that? Sing like that? Study like that? Fellowship like that? I would like to give you today is some scripture, a system, and a story as we look towards the Advent season. The scripture is what we call the Psalms of Ascent. In your Bible, there is a group of Psalms, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, that are called the Psalms of Ascent. And in fact, if you have a Bible, your own Bible, and you were to open up next to those numbers, 120, 120, 120, 122, up to 130, it'll probably say Psalms of Ascent or Psalms of Degrees. These were the psalms that the, the Jewish people would sing and chant and recite on their way to Jerusalem. There were set times during the year when they were, as a whole nation, make their way to Jerusalem. There were times in the course of a month where they say, you know what, I need to go to the temple. These were the psalms that they would sing in preparation. And so here it is. Maybe it's, 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 the, it's Passover or it's Tabernacle. It's one of those national times we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people all making their way towards the center of the faith. And here you are walking along the road and we'd all be singing the same songs. We'd be singing these poems. We'd be singing them out. To, it works like this. Ready? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. Yeah, see, well, we know the song. We're singing it together. And so as we're going towards, we're preparing our hearts and minds to make our way up to, because Jerusalem was up on a high hill, make our way up to Jerusalem and the temple. These are the Psalms that they would sing on their way up to prepare their hearts, to prepare the fields of their souls, to do the worship of God. These psalms, Carolyn and I have been sitting in a while for about four months, have put together a system that might help you gather with the saints of God. Now you might say, I got this down. Awesome. You're a good farmer. You're a good gardener. You know how to keep your soil. You know how to keep your faith. You have a rhythm. When it comes to Sunday morning, awesome. God bless you. You don't have to listen to anything I say. You're free. But you can go home now. I'm just kidding. Thank you for not leaving. Some of you are like, dude, I have no idea what to do on Sunday morning. I just, in fact, I got a lot to do on Sunday morning. Sometimes church fits in, sometimes it doesn't. All right, thank you for being honest. Like, I never watched dad go to church. I never saw dad in church. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do the night before. I don't know what I'm supposed to do the morning of. I don't know. Dude, I just, yeah, so, I had to go to Pickle anyways, figured I'd just stop off here for a little bit. Cool, thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna take that energy and let's give a system, let's shape it, let's give it a pattern. 
Let's use Psalm 120 and following as that pattern. We've got to start somewhere. Brian, can I ask you a farming question? Thank you. I would imagine that farming is a year-long process, right? Like, it's like January. To, Karen's shaking her head. Like, it's, it's January to December. There's always something that needs to be done. Is that correct? Like, even when the land's resting, we might be working on machinery or prepping or making phone calls. Is that right? So you can't cut out, like, any part of it. Right? Like, we can't say, you know what, this year we're not going to do March through May. Is, is that possible? <laughs> and move in with someone. <laughs> so you couldn't cut that part out and expect a good harvest, right? Okay. We've got to start somewhere. We need to turn and make sure all parts are included. So why don't we start with Psalm 120? If you look inside of your notes, we included an ascent guide. And that guide walks you through seven steps. If you remember our message guides, you know, they go top down. We're not going top down, we're going bottom up. So the banner's down here and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That QR code I'm gonna reference later. But let's start on the bottom. Let's start where we're at. And for the sake of this system, for this, this rhythm of faith, let's say we start on Saturday night at sunset. That's a good place to start. God likes to start things at sunset. So imagine, if you will, we're approaching Saturday, we're approaching sunset. This is what I would encourage you to do if you don't have a rhythm, a pattern of faith. What if Saturday night, as the sun's going down, you had a candle? The world's full of darkness. It's full of chaos. Do some of you know of what I speak? Yeah. Well, what if we lit a candle? What if we read or had those words of Psalm 120 read to us? These are the words of Psalm 120. They go like this. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What he's saying is, God, I feel I'm in a land of falsehood, a land of lies. Deliver me to truth. What shall be given to you? What more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? The, arrow sh the warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals with the broom tree. Woe to me. I sojourn in Meshech. I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Meshech and Kedar, those are geographical regions. They're probably pagan centers. It's really hard to interpret it accurately. But they are places that are antithetical to the places of Jerusalem, opposites to the places of God. He's saying, I live in this space. I live in chaos. I live in catastrophe. I'm in disaster right now. That's where I'm at. It's darkness. And he says, verse 6, too long I have made my dwelling among those who hate peace. I'm for peace. When I speak, they're for war. This is the beginning. This is the, the recognition that I'm in a, a place of brokenness and chaos. I'm in a place where things are hard and difficult and dark. But I've been there too long. I am for peace, even though I'm surrounded by war. So let's begin the journey. Let's light a candle. Let's read these words. What Carolyn and I have done is prepared for each of these steps an audio, a visual that you could listen to, to follow along. Maybe you don't want to do it by yourself or you need a little bit of an extra nudge to follow along to kind of help you focus. Uh, Ryan, would you play an example, please? Go ahead and turn it up. As we begin with step one, Gather around a central location in your home, whether that be a dining room table or living room. Light your candle and read along or just listen with us as we begin our Psalms of Ascent. This is Psalm 120. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered, Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you? 
And what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? A warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Let us read that again as we... Time. It's, it's a, a way to enter into the scripture, to enter into the spirit. And, and so what the team also did was about a month ago, they got together at Marion Wintrow's house and they made candles, beeswax candles. And so maybe you saw those at the table out there. So every family is invited to go pick out a candle of your choice. And maybe Saturday night, let's gather around. Let's light a candle. Let's listen to that passage or read it ourselves maybe with our spouse or together with family or on our own. Let's unplug from devices, close up tablets, turn off the TV. Maybe read some of the gospels together. Maybe read through the Psalms of Ascent. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, gave a great filter. He says, whatever is you know, true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Think on these things. Our whole week, we've been surrounded by chaos and death. Our whole week, I guard myself from these assassins three, from Satan and society and the sin in me. These, they've been pressuring me and pushing me and taking and informing and shaping. It's no, 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 no. I'm making a decision. I'm going to the house of the Lord tomorrow. I'm going to light a candle. In that same space, in step one, that Saturday night, I would encourage you to do something else, especially if you have young ones. Help them enter that space. Plan through, think through Sunday morning. What's the rhythm? What's the schedule? Who's taking a shower tonight? Who's taking a shower in the morning? What are we wearing? No, you're not wearing that. Oh, husband, I got you a shirt. Providing a rhythm, especially for young ones, helps them anticipate and prepare. But know this. They have three assassins that they battle against too. Satan, society, and the sin in them. Yes. Yes. Decide on Saturday night, what time do we need to leave so that we can get to House on the Rock 10 to 15 minutes before worship begins. So if you go to church at 10, <laughs> 10 trust, oh girl. <laughs> Five minutes before. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say anything. I, and I tried real hard not to look over it when I said that. <laughs> Remember those patterns? Remember those forces that try to work against us? Yeah. What time do we need to leave the house, everyone in the car, the car going down the driveway, so that we can get here 10 to 15 minutes before church begins? Why? Because church beginning isn't the only thing that needs to happen. We're entering into a space with other people, and we want to participate in that and be a part of it. Make those decisions, make those thoughts, make those plans, knowing that the very first time you try this, the next 10 times you try this, it will be a disaster. You know why? Oh, I guard myself against Satan, these enemies three. What? Satan. They'll do things. Society. It'll do something. I think, wasn't it your mom one year that the garage door wouldn't open when she tried to go to church? Yeah, there's always something that comes up, right? And the sin in me. Oh, uh, I think today I just would be a good day for me to stay home. It's just, you know, I need some me time. I'll watch online. I'll stream. We began streaming back in COVID in 2020 as a way to help keep people connected to the church and connected to the sermons. I was against it. I'm still against it. I don't think it's best. It's too easy for us to give in to bad habits. 
If you have to work on Sunday morning, you have to work on Sunday morning. A lot of people do. A lot of, so you're not watching it, right? You mean you're not watching the streaming service while you're working. If you're sick, you're sick. Last thing you want to do is listen to me sing. <laughs> Believe me. What we are going to do in January is we're going to stop streaming the services live. We're going to still continue to record it. Carolyn and the team will edit it and post it to the website so that you can have access to it. It's too easy for us to make bad decisions when it comes to streaming. Other churches might have a different rhythm or a different rhythm and pattern. Here, let's prioritize gathering together in the same space. Does that make sense? Well, we've lit a candle, we, we've gathered around Psalm 120, we've unplugged, and we're really, hey, let's play dominoes, let's paint, let's do something, let's just stare at each other mindlessly for a while, but let's be still and quiet and know that we're preparing our hearts. Now it's time for bed. Let's extinguish the candle, let's move to bedtime. Psalm 121 kind of speaks to some of these ideas. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. What if you listened to that psalm being read or maybe you read it over your kids or your spouse and instead of giving into anxiety and worry and fear, you gave sleep into the hands of God and let him prepare your heart and mind for the day to come. If you were to follow the QR code that's on the top of your message guide, it would take you to a page on our website that lists all of these seven steps, all of the support of reading and videos and music, so that you could go there, listen to it, read along to it, share in it, and move into a slumber that God is watching over. Step one, step two, step three. Let's wake up. It's Sunday morning. I, was, I rejoiced when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Now I know that we all have different Sunday rhythms. We all have different morning rhythms. We're not gonna get into the fine minutia on what y'all do when it comes to getting ready for the day. I'm sure that there are certain things that we might have in common. One of them is looking in a mirror right? No doubt you all go into the bathroom at some point on Sunday morning. Most of you look into a mirror. Most of you do something about it. We gave you and have provided inside your gift bags a mirror decal that you could stick on your bathroom mirror. As you reflect upon Psalm 122, it says this, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. As you go through Psalm 122, it's this tension back and forth. I'm excited to go meet with God's people and I'm asking God's blessing upon God's people. I'm gonna prepare. I'm gonna get ready. You get the kids up and running. Maybe you're just getting yourself ready. You remembered, all right, I need to leave the house at this time so I can get to church 10 to 15 minutes ahead of worship beginning. You go through your morning rhythm. It's now time to depart. It's time to leave. You're gonna get in your car. You're gonna get in your vehicle. There's a couple things that we've given you for the drive. One of them is a rear view mirror hanger, okay? Kind of looks like a handicapped parking thing from that... <laughs> On Sunday morning, put this on your mirror. On this side that faces you, it says this. This is from Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. If you were to bring up the recording for this step for step four, Carolyn will read Psalm 126, 127, and 130. Walking us through the Psalms of Ascent. Now that's only about two minutes. What am I supposed to do the rest of the way? ACDC. <laughs> Maybe a little Megadeth. Maybe a little P. Diddy. He seems to be in the news a lot. <laughs> well, he does have a worship album. <laughs> Carolyn also curated. <laughs> 
song lists, about 15 minutes long. Some of them are more modern praise songs, some of them more traditional. There's some Christmas sets. You could play those. Have the kids participate. Have the kids sing along. Keep your heart safe. These, I guard myself against these assassins three, Satan, society, and the sin in me. I grew up going to church. If there's ever going to be a meltdown, you know when it's going to happen, right? It's going to be in the car. What if we created some space? There's something else that we provided. It's a vent clip. Okay? It has, Karen, don't say anything. Okay? It has frankincense and myrrh on it. This is completely optional. Some people have smell sensitivities. Okay? What did the wise men bring to Jesus? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are gifts appropriate for a king. Those were expensive resins that were very hard to come and buy. Those were, those were cast upon the brazier at the temple. Those would swell up and smoke up and smell up in, in, in a symbol of prayer as the prayers of saints rise up to God. But there's another thing about smell. It's very mnemonic. Very mnemonic, isn't it? Meaning you smell something, you remember something, don't you? Like when I smell this, I remember that. Yeah. Maybe on Sunday morning. Your choice, completely optional to me. Maybe you take this out and you put it in the vent clip. And that frankincense and that myrrh. If you want, Karen, you don't have to. Another way for the kids to participate. Oh, I smell it. Where are we going? We're going to the house of the Lord. What are we going to do? We're going to go worship. We're going to go pray. We're going to go sing. Hey, who brought, who brought frankincense and myrrh to Jesus? The wise men did. Yeah, the wise men did, didn't they? Yeah. You make your journey in. You pull in. Step five. What do you do when you pull into your parking space at House on the Rock on Sunday morning? Don't do anything. Don't get out of the car. We don't want to rush this. We don't have to. We got here 10 to 15 minutes early. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our mind. Step five. It says this. Psalm 131. Let me read it for you. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. 131. I'm sorry, I rushed. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great, too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. I have like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I'm sitting there in, in, in my car. We're just going to catch, we're going to play that video file, that, that recording. The kids can listen or it's just me. I'm in that space. I'm quieting my soul. I'm about to go in and meet with the people of God. I am going to gather together with the saints. I get to be with fellow brothers and sisters, saved, sanctified, and sealed Brothers and sisters that God has so ordained to gather around me, to nurture me in my faith, that I get to nurture in their faith. This ain't like the Kiwanis. This ain't like the Lions Club. This ain't like the sports bar. This is something sacred, something special. Whew. All right. This is awesome. Maybe I see a couple of people walking through the parking lot. Lord, would you bless them at church today? Lord, would you help them with their burdens today? And then, kids, we ready? All right, let's go. We're into the building. Maybe you have to drop some kids off, the nursery or the pre-K. You shake some hands, you get some coffee, you check in with your life group. Maybe it's a serving Sunday, whatever it might be. But eventually you walk in the building. How many of you sat on a stone this morning? You had altar stones that were placed on the chairs. They're just lava rock. You might find them in a brazier. Not brazier, a brazier, or a fire ring. There's one right there as you walked in. What if when we walked through those doors, we took this stone with us and we placed it on that altar, upon that brazier? What if we said, Lord, I'm here. I'm here. I'm joining with the saints. 
I'm going to pray with them. I'm going to sing with them. I'm going to learn with them. I'm a part of something. I was alone and forsaken and forgotten all week. I did things, saw things, was a part of things. But Father, I'm here. Like the prophet Isaiah, I'm here. I bring myself to this space. Lord, let's do something great. I'm going to place that there on the brazier. Starting next week, along that corner of the wall, there'll be a prayer wall with prayer requests, a way to put up prayer requests. Maybe you'll go over and share something. I'm struggling with this. Or maybe you'll pray over something that you might see. You'll make your way to your seats. The announcement loop will be playing. Within the announcement loop, you'll see parts of Psalm 133 cycling through. It goes like this. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when, brethren, when brothers dwell in unity. For there the Lord has commanded a blessing, life forevermore. You want to know what will kill a church? Disunity. Disregard. But where there's unity, a oneness, God commands blessing. So I might sit in my seat. I'm, I'm checking in with the announcements to make sure I know what's going on in my church family. I see people saying, God, would you place your blessing upon that person? God, would you place your blessing? In fact, that, I'm, you know what? I'm an introvert, but gosh darn it, that's not an excuse. I'm going to get over it. I'm going to sit next to that person. How are you? How can I pray for you? Could you pray for me? Yeah. Be in that space together. Seeking the unity. Praying for the unity. Asking God to command his blessing upon our church family. The countdown happens. Vanessa will make her announcements. Let guests know that we're glad that they're here. Let me know some things that I might be missing. But then within that countdown, that, that last minute, I'm going to start to see echoes of Psalm 134. It says this, Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. And then it closes, May the Lord bless you. Oh, you see that tension? You see that back and forth? May you bless him and may he bless you. That's the kind of service we want to experience. That's the gathering I want to be a part of. Twelve hours before this, I was in a place of darkness and regret and shame. But God, by your grace, you've brought me to your space. May I be a blessing. God, would you please bless me? Then as the countdown closes, the Apostle Creed comes up and we testify together what we believe. Not just what we believe, but what the body of Christ believes. I had the privilege of getting together with some local pastors. We do this every couple months. Pastors from churches throughout the community, the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, Baptist Church, Methodist Church. We get together just to hang out and have lunch and laugh. You know what I know? We disagree about a lot of stuff. We disagree about a lot of stuff. But you know what we do believe in? Believe in the Father, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then the service might continue with song or prayer, a corporate reading, a message. But I left... I left that space of death and regret and shame. And by God's grace, I've let the soil of my soul be tilled and shaped and molded. And I've done the same thing for my kids' hearts, my, the heart of my spouse, the heart of my church. And I'm going to prepare so that seeds of grace and gospel can be pressed down deep. Like every good farmer knows, if you just be patient, harvest comes. Scripture, a system, a story. When I say amen, maybe you've seen it already. There's Christmas decorations at the wazoo out there. Some of them Karen has dedicated for uh, Garbage, and they should be. Some of them have been set aside to be put up. Some of them are new. We're going to deck the halls. Some of you have already put up decorations. Amy, I know you did, right? Yeah, you did like four months ago. You had Christmas up, didn't you? Yeah, that's okay. Jesus was born in September. You're, you're good to go. You're good to go. 
Some of you are, haven't yet, but you're going to. But we're moving into that season. And some of you are going to set up a crash and a nativity set. And you're going to have the baby, right? And you're going to have Joseph and Mary. You're going to have shepherds, right? And you know what you're not going to put there? Thank you. This is a biblical church and we do it God's way. I went back through my notes and in nine Christmases at House on the Rock, I've never done a message series on the wise men. Which is shameful because that's us. These are the pagan Gentiles that God's grace called from afar and welcomed to his presence. That, that, that we are them. I mean, not, I mean, not so wise. But are we not a people in a pagan place surrounded by pagan and surrounded by broken? We don't know much about Jesus, but we do know there is a king. And so let's make the journey. And so for four weeks, we're going to follow that story. Let's, let's see what it means to have the grace of God, that star shine bright and call us to that house where Jesus is. Let's look at the gifts that they brought, how they made the journey. Let's watch out for that Herod heart that does not like a good king. Let's talk about what does it mean to bow down? What does it mean to make a sacrifice of praise? Let's gather, let's journey together. Artist, would you come up, please? I know this isn't for everybody. Some of you have well-established systems and patterns. We can be honest. The faith that you have is a reflection of the pattern that you follow. You have as much of God as you want. That's what A.W. Tozer said. For those of you who did not grow up discipled into a Sunday morning rhythm, maybe this will be very helpful. Could you imagine, if you would, please, what would happen if, let's just say, 20 of us started doing this next Sunday? What would happen if 30 of us started doing this next Sunday, Saturday night, preparing our hearts and minds to meet with God's people? What would happen if half of us started to do this? Could you imagine... Can you hear, just within your sacred imagination, can you imagine the sound of the first verse of the first song next Sunday morning? If we all had begun the night before preparing hearts and minds to meet with our Lord. Thank you for sharing your time with us. And we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. And that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.